Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Good morning. I hope you are having a wonderful day. It is a great day here in the Wood household. We had our first sleepover with our grandson, Raylan. So he's here with us today. So if you hear some extra playing in the background, or if you notice Ed in and out, it's just a little busy around here this morning. It's just normal life. Welcome to our world. Glad to have you. Do you want to come here? I thought so. Look here. Say good morning. Can you say good morning? Okay, you just sit there and you be cute. That's your job. You just sit there and you be cute. Oh, Mom's going to get on to me because we didn't get your hair all combed and everything. We're still in our jammies. And we're still in our jammies. But, hey, this is life, and we're just living it. Okay, so, just so you guys know, we are on our third session of this unit. And this unit is all about um, the source of temptation. And so the first week, we actually looked at what is the source of temptation. And then last week, we looked at, oh, sorry, my partner's got to go. Sorry, I mean, I don't mean to be mean or anything, but you guys were not quite as exciting as you thought you were going to be. But anyway, um, last week we looked at tem the temptation to rely on myself, and today we're looking at the temptation to test God. Yeah, the temptation to test God. And we're going to be reading um, from the book of Matthew, and we're also going to be reading from the book of Deuteronomy. So Matthew, we're going to be in chapter 4, we're looking at verses 5 through 7, and Deuteronomy, we're going to be in chapter 6, and we're looking at verses 16 through 25. So that's where our lesson is going to be out of today, and we're going to read over this, and then we're going to pray over this, and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to lead us through this. So, here we go. Um, Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. Okay, and then going on to Deuteronomy. Oh, come here, come here. Are you okay? We boinked our head. We're okay. Well, we need our papa, but we're okay. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 16 through 25. Do not test the Lord your God as you tested him at Massa. Carefully observe the commands of the Lord your God, the decrees, and the statutes that he has commanded you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that you may prosper, and that so that you may enter and possess the good land that the Lord your God swore to give your ancestors by driving out all of your enemies before you, as the Lord has said. When your sons ask in the future, what is the meaning of the decrees, statutes, and ordinance that the Lord your God has commanded you, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. Before our eyes, the Lord inflicted great and devastating signs and wonders on Egypt, on Pharaoh, and on his household. But he brought us from there in order to lead us in and give us the land that he swore to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to follow all the statutes and to fear the Lord our God for our prosperity always and for our preservation as it is today. Righteousness will be ours if we... If we are careful to follow every one of these commands before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So that's our that's our our, ver, our verses for today. And we're going to pray over these and then we're just going to dive into this lesson and find the, the word that's here for you and I today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for everything that you have given us. We come to you today and we are humble and we are excited and we're hungry lord we want the word from you we want the lesson from you and we ask that you be with us today as we go through this that you block anything that may be of satan and you only allow your word to show through holy spirit guide us through this lesson open our eyes to see your word we ask all of this in your precious name amen okay so 
like I said, we're in our third lesson today, and it's this whole unit is um, about temptation and how we can really fall subject to it, that we can um, be questionable about the source of the temptation. We studied that, that, um, that we can really rely on ourselves. you know, that we don't need God to bring us through this, that we just need to figure it out on our own. It's, it's really not that big a deal. We can handle this. You know, that was our last week's lesson. And today we're looking at the temptation to test God. You may think, whoa, I don't test God. Mm. We'll, we'll keep looking at that as we go through, and we'll see. Okay, so there's a little note here in our book, and it says, Satan told Jesus that God wouldn't allow him to suffer harm, even if he jumped off the Temple Mount. As people made in God's image, God loves us, and he places an incredibly high value on human life. So that's a lesson right there. We need to realize that humans are loved. And, I mean, we're created in God's image. So we need to value that. We need to value ourselves. Not higher than someone else, mind you. But ourselves. And we need to value other humans. And it goes on here and it says, We must be careful never to test God by living recklessly or treating others as less valuable than God sees them. That is a lesson for us right there. That we need to understand that we're not any more valuable than someone else. And we need to value all humans. Because all humans are made in the image of God. And sometimes that's really hard with some humans. Yeah. We're just going to lay that down there and be honest today. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to honor. And to, it doesn't mean that you always have to agree with how someone is living or the decisions that they're making. But it means that in spite of how they're living and in spite of the decisions they're making, you love them. And you show God's love to them. And that is a big lesson for almost all of us. It's a big lesson. Okay, so... As we're going through this, and we start at the beginning of our lesson in Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, um, it says, The devil took him to the holy city. So the him that's being talked about, took him, is Jesus. So first and foremost, the devil did not take Jesus anywhere that he didn't already want to go. The devil has absolutely no control over Jesus. Jesus has authority over the devil. So always understand that and don't ever get sidetracked thinking the devil had control to take Jesus and put Jesus somewhere because he didn't. Jesus willingly went because he wanted to fulfill scripture. And so when it says the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not even strike your foot against a stone. So this is the second time that the devil has tried to pull Jesus over into this fantasy if land. If is not a real place. If is not a real point in time. If is just this fantasy world that if God loves me, then he won't let this happen to me. If these people really like me, then they will do whatever it is that I want them to do. If you really knew me, you would know my heart and you would know how you needed to help me. If. If is never, never land. It's fantasy. It's not reality. It's this little place that we make up here in our mind that if the world was perfect, life would go like this. Well, the world isn't perfect. And life is never going to go the way you and I plan on it to go. Ever. And so, but the devil is trying to bring Jesus over into this if fantasy land. And Jesus, praise the Lord, is strong enough and bold enough and brave enough to understand that if is not reality. 
And so in our minds, the lesson for me here is I need to listen to this in my mind. If I start hearing myself, well, if, if I was really valued, then, you know, I would, I would feel it. If Ed really loved me, then he would know that he hurt my feelings. If, you know, whatever it is. I mean, if can be a thousand million different things. But number one, if is not reality. If is just crazy. And we don't want to live in crazy. We want to live in reality. And, and to understand that we are God's chosen people and we have an incredible gift that he has given us. He literally made us to do life with us. So you are valued and important and honored by the most high God. And that, that should be where we draw our strength and our value and our worth from. Not from that if the world thought that I was popular or pretty or smart or, you know, loved or whatever it is that we want to throw down there in that if world, then this would happen. This X, Y, Z thing would happen. And that's not, that's not where we should be getting our value from. Okay. So, um, the other thing to understand is that Satan said, because it tells us in scripture and scripture is truth. Satan said, for it is written, he has given his, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Lesson here. Satan knows the scripture. Satan knows the scripture hands down better than Terry Wood knows the scripture. The problem is, is that Satan twists that scripture. He turns it ever so slightly. So that he can confuse us and he can give us doubt and he can give us reason to go over here and live in this if land rather than living in the reality that is God. And so while he said it word for word, he did repeat the scripture word for word, verse for verse. He threw in in the beginning the if, if, if God really loves you, if you're really the son of God. If you really have all this power, if, 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 and Jesus, because he is all knowing, he is all perfect. He is everything, you know, came right back and said, it is also written, do not test the Lord, your God. And so, you know, while Satan wants to bring scripture at us and turn it ever so slightly so that we are disillusioned and we don't necessarily know what you know we're like well that is what it says well it is what it says but it's not if you're putting things in front of it if you're trying to you know base that you have to do this so that this will happen you know that's not the way it's written that's that's not that's not the way God intended it to be and so Jesus who is also extremely knowledgeable in verses came right back with him saying you're right I mean it does say that it also says don't test the Lord your God and yeah you know, I mean so you can think you know this was because he had Jesus standing on this temple and you know so what about if I jump out of an airplane well if I jump out of an airplane not wearing a parachute saying God's gonna catch me on my way down chances are I'm going to hit the ground at a rapid rate of speed. But if I am trained and if I have my parachute on and I have an instructor there and I know what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to do it and I jump out of the airplane, my parachute is going to save me. My parachute is going to open and, I mean, God willing, and the parachute and God will see me safely to the ground. But I didn't just jump out of the plane saying, if it's God will, I'll live. Well, that's testing God. It's like, um, you know, saying that, you know, God, if, if, if you allow this to happen, if you allow 
whatever it is to happen in my life, then I will, I will do anything you want me to do, Lord. I will, I will, I will walk any path you set in front of me, Lord, if you do this. Well, no. Number one, God is not a genie in a bottle. You don't get to, to make wishes and you don't get to make demands. That is testing God. Because we're saying, if you prove yourself that you're really God, then I'll follow the path that you set in front of me. No, we should follow the path that God sets in front of us because that's being obedient to God. Because that's doing his work in his will. But putting all of these stumbling blocks, these tests in front of him, that's not being obedient. That's saying, prove yourself. Prove that you're God. So it goes on, and we are going to Deuteronomy now. We're Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And so this is Old Testament, and um, it says, Do not test the Lord your God as you tested him at Massa. Carefully observe the commands of the Lord your God, the decrees and the statutes that he commanded you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that you may prosper and so that you may enter and possess the good land that your, the Lord your God swore to give your ancestors by driving out all of your enemies before you as the Lord has said. And so, the, you know, Moses is talking to Israel and God had just brought Israel out of captivity in Egypt where they had been oppressed by the Egyptians for years and so now, he's rescued them. And all of this first generation Israelites had seen God's wonders. I mean, they had seen God perform signs and wonders against Egypt throughout all the plagues that he brought across them. And they had seen God destroy the Egyptian army at the Red Sea when, when he parted the Red Sea so that the Israelites could walk through. And then when the armies got in there, he brought the sea back together and, and the armies were, were destroyed. And then when they got in the wilderness, they had seen God provide manna for them on a daily basis so that they weren't hungry, so that they didn't have to grow crops, they didn't have to provide food. It was literally given to them every single day. They had seen all of these things. And even though they had seen all these things, they still didn't believe. Not truly, not completely, because they still complained. Then they started complaining because there wasn't the water that they wanted to drink. And in fact, they became so distraught that they wondered if God had actually brought them out into this desert, out of slavery, into this desert, just to allow them to die of thirst. And I mean, he provided everything. He took care of everything. And so they really started to think that he had done all of this just so they could die of thirst. And, you know, they complain, you know, God isn't even here. He, isn't, he, he doesn't even care. He doesn't care about us at all. He's just going to let us sit out here and die of thirst. I mean, yeah, he brought us out of slavery. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he rescued us from the armies. Okay, you know, whatever. Yes, he provided food for us daily. Okay, but now, now he's abandoned us. Now he's just going to leave us lay out here and we're just going to die thirsty. You know, and we can be like, oh, what is with those people? What is wrong with them? But are we really a lot different? Are we? We should be able to look back over our lives and we should be able to see God's blessings everywhere if we're looking for them. And we should see his faithfulness that he has never left us and he never abandoned us. And there may have been times when we distance ourselves from God, but God was always there. He was always faithful. We were the ones that were taking steps away. He was constant and remained and was always there. And so God provides for our needs. It may not be the way that you and I are requesting it to be done, but he does provide for our needs. And it may not look the way we want it to look. 
It may not have the bright shiny that we want it to have, but it's there. And he provides. He protects us. He tries to protect us from harm. Sometimes he can't protect us from ourselves. I mean, he could, but we also have the free will to choose. And mo sometimes we choose poorly. We choose to hurt others. We choose to hurt ourselves. We choose to put ourselves in situations that are not going to have a good outcome. And that's on us. That's not on God. That's on you and I. That's on the choices that we make. Um, and when we face a new hardship, you know, even though we can see all of these things that he's done for us in the past, all of these blessings that he's given us, all of this faithfulness that he's provided daily for us, still yet, when we face a new hardship, we're just like, where are you, God? Where are you? Why are you not here? Why are you not seeing what's going on? How can you allow this to happen? How can you allow me, me, to walk this? I thought I was important to you. I thought I was, I thought I was your chosen one. We are. It doesn't mean we're exempt. It doesn't mean we're exempt from life or the choices that others make in life. It doesn't mean that we're not going to face hardship. It doesn't mean that we're not going to face trials. We studied that last week. Those trials, those things that we're in the middle of, those temptations that we face, those give us the opportunity to grow in our faith. Because when we're in that hardship, instead of turning to God and being mad at him, we should turn to God and seek him. And we should get in our Bible and we should get in our verses and we should get in prayer. Instead of complaining, why are we not praying? Why is our first reaction to just get mad at God because he's not doing it the way we want him to do it? When we should, and this is a lesson for Terry Wood, we should be turning to him in prayer first and going to him and being like, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know how you're getting this done. But I know that in the end, I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to honor you. I'm still going to love you because you are my God and I am your people. And whatever it takes to get to the other side, I will say that every day. Why? It's so hard for us to do that. Um, so after they were given this command not to test God, they were also given the command to carefully observe the commands of the Lord your God and do what is right and good in God's sight. So after they were given the, the command, the Israelites were given the command, don't test God. Then they were given the command, do what is right and good in God's sight. And I think that's where we need to be. You know, God wanted to bless the Israelites. He wanted to bring them into the promised land. That was the plan all along. God wants to bless us. He wants to bring us into the promised land. That's the plan, to do life with you and I. You and I are usually the ones that get in the way of that plan. Okay, so our final part of our verses, it says... Um, when your sons ask you in the future, what is the meaning of the decrees and the statutes and the ordinance that the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. Before our eyes, the Lord inflicted great and devastating signs and wonders on Egypt, on Pharaoh, and on all of his household. But he brought us from there, in order to lead us in and give us the land that he swore to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to follow all of these statutes and to fear the Lord our God for our prosperity always and for our preservation as it is today. So a lot of us, um, and Christians especially, we really like tradition. I mean, I really do like tradition. I like... Um, I like 
attending Christmas Eve candlelight service. I like um, traditional hymns, and I love new hymns, and I love new modern music. And so to me, that's kind of where the mix and the marriage starts, because I love the tradition, but I like the new also. And I think our book, it tells us, it says, tradition is also sometimes viewed as a negative thing, because, you know, that's the way it's always been done. Well, that's where we have to be careful about. We don't want to do it the same way that it's always been done, because it's always been done that way. You know, and we have to be so, so careful about that. So careful about that. Well, we can't change that. That's the way it's always been done. Why? Why? I mean, is it scripture? If it's scripture, then okay. But if it's not scripture, if it's just, it's the way it's always been done in the Baptist church because it's the way it's always been done, it doesn't mean that it can't be done differently. It doesn't mean that we can't go at it a different way. It just means that that's the tradition. Well, if you can base the tradition on scripture, then that's one thing. But if we're basing the tradition on because it's the way it was done 40 years ago, that's a whole other thing. In our book, it tells us, it says, tradition is also often used as a negative thing. However, tradition can be very important as a part of Christian faith. The danger with tradition is when we do things simply because they're a tradition. As one generation passed down beliefs and practices to the next generation, it's important to include the reason behind the beliefs and the practices. So you don't want to just go to church because your family has always gone to church. You don't want to just, you know, say grace before meals because your family has always said grace before meals. We want to go to church because we are the church. We want to go to church because we are showing our faith. We are receiving a blessing when we walk in the building. We are worshiping our God and giving him thanks for the things that he has done for us this week. And we are receiving a blessing to lead us through this next week, to take us out into the mission field that is our home, to take us out into the mission field that is our town, our job, our school, our our life, and walk that missionary life that God is leading us to, even if that missionary life is right here in Eminence, Missouri. But we need to be filled up with that. We need to have that filling from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus, from God, constantly. Because we can't give what we don't have. And if we're not being blessed, if we're not receiving that, we don't have anything to give away. And if we're not giving God the praise and the worship that he so rightly deserves, then we don't have that to give away. So we don't want to do it because it's the way it's always been done. We want to do it for the reason that it's intended. We want to give thanks before we eat because God provided that food that we're getting ready to nourish our bodies with. He provided it to give us strength to go out and do his will. So give thanks, give praise, give honor where it's due and it's due to God because he provided it for us. So to me, that's what that means. And then it finishes up and it says, righteousness will be ours if we carefully follow every one of these commands before the Lord our God as he commanded us. So, you know, it just it finishes up here and it says, here's the question. How do we, re- how do we respond to this great deliverance? The I- Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt and God called them to respond through their lives of faith and obedience. Today, God has delivered us from the slavery of sin. Just like the Egyptians, or just like the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, we were slaves in sin. And God delivered us from that slavery. He brought us out of it. He crushed it. He broke those chains. He brought us through it. And we're called to respond in the same way. Trusting God with our whole lives and living and following Jesus in all the ways that he lived. 
So in teaching, in reaching out, in ministry, in honoring God, in seeking God, in praying to God, in all those things that Jesus did, that's what we're called on to do. That's the deliverance. That's being brought out of that slavery is to do life with God through Jesus. That's what it is. So that's our lesson today. I thought it was a really good lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you if you have it in your heart that you need to go to church, then you need to go to church today. Slip some clothes on. Jeans and a t-shirt. You'll be fine. Come on in. You don't have anybody to sit with? You can sit with me. You don't have anybody to walk in with? Text me. Message me. I'll walk in with you. If you're on your way to our church and you feel God saying, I think that looks like a good church for you. Pull in the parking lot. They want to do worship with you. They want you there. Pull in. Get out of the car. Walk in the building. He wants to do life with you. He's inviting you. I pray that you find a church family somewhere. I pray that God gives you an extra special blessing that is just for you today. I'm going to close this in uh, prayer. And if you want to join us, we will be at the Baptist Church. Uh, east on 106 here at Eminence at the Caution Light. And we would love to have you. Sunday school starts at 945. You're welcome to join us. Or there are lots of classes. There is classes for everybody. And it's not your traditional Sunday school. It is more of life lessons. Life lessons with God. I like that. And our service starts at 1045. So we'd love to have you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your deliverance. We thank you for the way that you give us every day to follow you. For allowing us the opportunity of free will so that it's our choice to follow you. So that we get to make that choice to do life with you. We thank you so much for that. We ask that you be with us as we go throughout our day, Lord. Open our hearts and open our minds to see the ways that you're giving us to serve. And we just give you so much praise and so much honor and so much glory. Amen. Okay, thanks guys. See you next week. Bye.